May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be to the greater honor and glory of God. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> My father's employer, the man who owned the barber shop in which my father worked, had a lake, and from time to time uh, we would go out and go fishing at this lake. I happened to be about seven or eight years old, uh, and when one time we went out uh, to his lake to fish, and he he invited us into his house to have lunch. And as we sit down, and just before I was getting ready to just like dig in, because we were not a you know, grace saying family, uh, the uh, his, the boss says, um, "Let's say grace." And he says, "Alan, would you like to say grace?" Well, being that young, I was just forthright and said, "I can't. I don't know how to pray." My father was very embarrassed, very ashamed, uh, not only uh, me, but uh, himself and kind of our had shamed our family. But as I said, we had not been a family who uh, prayed grace at meals. So afterwards, I got uh, to learn from my father about how to say grace. Not that we changed and became a family that said grace, but at least for any future situation in which we were invited to a meal, if I was asked to say grace, I knew how to do it. This, there, when we think of shame, we think of shame in, as a bad thing. And I looked up a number of articles, and most of the author, authors that I read, they think shame is a bad thing. But then I came across this article uh, from Vox Online Magazine called Why Shame is Good, and by Joseph Burgo, and this was from April 18, 2019. And he writes, shame is known as a toxic feeling, but it can also be a force for good. Shame has gotten a bad name in recent years. We've come to view it as corrosive legacy of sexual assault or abusive parenting. We see it as a weapon wielded by the intolerant against those who are different. It's the favorite tool of bullies everywhere, savaging their victims' sense of self-worth. Overall, we agree that shame is bad. But in my research I've conducted, I was surprised to hear over and again from psychologists, sociologists, and historians that shame has, for much of our history, been a force for good. According to recent studies in evolutionary uh, science, human beings developed the ability to feel shame because it helped promote social cohesion. Our inherited repertoire of emotions, including shame, evolved over long millennia when we lived in small tribes, when our survival depended heavily on close cooperation and adherence to tribal expectations of behavior. Members who violated the rules would be shunned and shamed. Fear of this painful experience encouraged members to obey the rules and work together for the good of the tribe. The function of shame is to prevent us from damaging our social relationships or to motivate us to repair them. Throughout history, society everywhere has made a use of shame to express their values and enforce expectations for how their members ought to behave towards one another. Of course, there's another side to it too. During periods of massive change, shame a tool that requires shared values across the society can quickly become a, de a divisive cudgel. But the kind of shame that shapes and reflects society's values has roots in a much more personal place. While often characterized as a destructive psychological feeling, shame can help people define their own values and live up to them. In learning to recognize le legitimate shame from toxic shame, we can wield shame as a tool for growth. Shame plays a vital and constructive role in governing interpersonal relationships. 
Parents regularly make use of shame to teach their children about acceptable behavior. Thus is to, so to socialize them into the tribe. While this might conjure images of the stocks or other harsh forms of shaming, more subtle examples are much more, much more common and productive. Mild expressions of disapproval that tell children how they're expected to conduct themselves. Shame is used to teach toddlers the concept of sharing, saying thanks, or greeting people. As a personal example, um, our daughter Amanda, all I had to do to her was say, I'm, I'm ashamed of you, or uh, I'm disappointed in you. And she would just bust out into tears, and she would want to do everything to, you know, to make things right. Dylan, on the other hand, if you said, I'm disappointed in you, you just kind of like, so? <laughs> Productive shame focuses on discrete traits or behaviors rather than entire, the entire person. Instead of making global statements about someone as completely worthless and irredeemable, productive shame leaves room for a person to feel good about themselves as a whole, while also suggesting changes that might help that person even feel better. Our evolutionary ancestors used shame and shunning to encourage change, to help tribal members reform their transgressive behavior and then reintegrate. Helpful shame always leaves room for improvement rather than making someone feel fundamentally worthless with no hope for growth. No one likes to be, uh, feel shame, but maybe it's less painful to be shamed by a good friend, someone you know and trust, someone who maybe has your back. If the relationship is strong enough, we can repent ask for forgiveness of the friend, and repair the relationship. On the other hand, how painful might it be to be put to shame by someone you dislike, or even an enemy, or being shamed by someone you define as an other, outside the norm of social, uh, of social norms. We stereotype and expect someone of the others to always behave and react in the way we believe they will always act and believe. The author of the Gospel of Luke goes out of his way, both figuratively and literally, to use people that Jewish society would call the others as a positive role model of faith in Jesus, the Christ, and Christian discipleship, to shame the Jews, but also to shame the people of his church, and Christians today. I say figuratively and literally. The figuratively is the shaming parables that Jesus tells. When confronted by a holier-than-thou self-righteous Jew, Jesus rebukes them with a shaming parable. The literally is the story Luke writes about when Jesus encounters people who are the others, in which the other exudes great unexpected faith in Jesus as the divine, as the divine. Two significant others in Luke's gospel are tax collectors and prostitutes, who are also called sinners. At the end of this month, on Sunday the 30th, we will hear the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Zacchaeus, as a tax collector, is seen as a traitor to the Jews. He is also an other to be shamed, to be shunned and hated. Jesus honors Zacchaeus by asking to eat at his house. During the meal, we hear how repentant and faithful Zacchaeus becomes, thus putting to shame the rich aristocratic Jews who flaunted their wealth and as a presumed blessing from God and a sign of their righteousness. Now back in Luke 7, Jesus invited, was invited to eat at the house of a Pharisee. And then a prostitute slips in unnoticed into the gathering and begins to anoint Jesus' feet with expensive oil, and she dries her, his feet with her hair. The Pharisee is disgusted that Jesus would allow himself to be defiled by this debased, sinful woman, this other. 
Jesus publicly praises the woman for her kindness and faith, thus shames the Pharisee for not showing similar hospitality. The ultimate worst of all the others in the eyes of the Jews were the Samaritans. The Jews considered Samaritans as half-breed Israelites because when the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Assyrians in 721 BC, both the exiled Israelites and the ones left behind intermarried with the Mes their Mesopotamian captors. While the Jews in the Babylonian exile claimed that they remained pure. They also despised each other over how to be faithful in worship of Yahweh. Most Jews had more respect and tolerance for Gentiles, uh, who they considered foreigners, than they did for Samaritans. Yet Jesus uses the Samaritan in his parable of the Good Samaritan to shame a self-righteous Jewish lawyer. The Good Samaritan is praised as being more merciful and godlike than a Jewish priest and a Levite. So now that I've set the stage and explained how shame plays a role in ancient biblical culture, let me explain how shame plays a part in today's gospel reading. The story starts out by showing the misery, indeed, that shows that indeed misery loves company. Ten lepers are hanging out together, and we are told that one of them happens to be a Samaritan. And we're not told how good or bad the nine Jews, the other Jewish lepers, treated the Samaritan. There's at least some level of tolerance between them for them to all be together. Jesus is traveling in border region between the Jewish-dominated Galilee and Samaria. The ten lepers see Jesus and his disciples coming their way and cry out to Jesus to show them mercy. This is the second noticeable occasion in which uh, Luke, that, uh, in, in, G in Jesus, counters a leper. Back in chapter 5, Jesus actually touches a leper and heals him. But this time, Jesus just speaks the healing into reality. All ten had faith enough to believe that they would be healed by Jesus' words. Jesus orders them to go and find the nearest priest and have their healing confirmed. They turn on their heels to leave, and we're told that they experience this healing. The shame of the story comes when the Samaritan returns to Jesus to praise God and humbles himself at Jesus' feet. He says, were there not ten of you? Where are the other nine? Where are the Jewish lepers? Why do only this person of the others, this Samaritan, return to give thanks to me? You have to understand that Jesus is saying all of this out loud, very loudly, loud enough that his disciples and his, all the following crowd can hear him and feel the shame seeping into their minds. Jesus responds to him, get up, be an equal to me in, in humanity and dignity, and go and resume a normal, productive life in society. Your faith has made you well. What Jesus is actually saying in the Greek is, your faith has saved you. Being saved has far more power and meaning than just being made well, being healed. So here's the takeaway or life uh, application that Jesus and Luke wants us to hear. We would all like to think that we fulfill our baptismal covenant to perfection each and every day. To see Christ in all persons, love your neighbor as yourself, and seek justice and respect the dignity of every human being. We would claim that we would do anything that Jesus asked us in the moment. But at what point in our life do we fall short and don't fully act on those convictions? We would like to think that we're not prejudiced or bigoted toward any person or people. But deep down, we probably all have someone that we would consider the other. That we don't have the fullest respect or dignity. 
How do we feel when we fall short in our faith and this person of the other stands up in their faith? The Christian response, if this scenario plays out, is that we are supposed to be shamed. It is given to us as an opportunity to repent of our shortcomings, to look with more respect of this other, and strive to correct our misguided thoughts and behaviors. Do we act like the nine Jews and take for granted the blessings God has given us? Or do we act like the Samaritan and then turn and praise to God for each and every blessing? Let us heed the words of the reading from 2 Timothy. Do your best to present yourselves to God as, a, an, as one approved by him. A worker has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the words of truth. Let us always seek to, seek to serve Christ, to love others, to see these others as human beings, as just like us, as fallen and in need of repentance, in need of a Savior, and also to know that when we are shamed, that we have a God who is forgiving and loving and wants to lift us back up again. Amen. Amen.